Good. Um, so thanks very much for the introduction and uh, thanks for inviting me, for inviting me along. So uh, yeah, my name is uh, Chris Norford and I say I am a full stack software developer uh, currently working as, as the head of development at Culture Shift. Um, and uh, I think it was mentioned before, so the main reason I'm here today is to talk to you um, about um, the topic of full stack development. And I, I wrote a book about full stack development. It it's kind of covers everything I've learned over, over my career, over the years I've, I've been doing software development. And it kind of covers pretty much every, every area that I think has, I've learned from and has helped me develop into being what I, I think of myself as, as a good and effective full stack software developer. Um, it focuses on uh, the web in particular as the as the software platform I particularly um, target. Um, but the the point of being a full stack developer is it goes beyond the technical skills and the programming skills needed to to create a you know a product or a website or a service or a bit of software. Um, and um, so that so my, my book does kind of balance 50% say technical skills, 50% the non-technical skills and, and in this talk. Um, I don't really have time to do technical deep dives, but um, so it'd be focusing more on the non-technical skills as, as well as some of the background. Um, so I I, um, I can't see the, the chat, so I think maybe I'll, I'll, I'll be taking some questions at the end, but if you drop them in the, in the chat, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll be able to then scroll back up and see them. Um, and yeah, my, my book is available with 20% off, so hopefully um, either you've got a, a link to it in, in the email or hopefully someone can drop it in the, in the chat. And it's just using this code uh, ACM Princeton, and that's valid for, for, I think, 28 days from today, uh, Quantum Publisher. So let, let's start by... Ooh, Yep, there we go. Let's start by asking the question, uh, what is um, a full stack developer? What what do we mean by that? And I think to answer this question, we kind of have to break down the words, <laughs> you know, what is a stack? What is a full stack? Hopefully we all know what a developer is, someone's a developer, someone who makes solutions. But let, let's start by looking at what we mean by stack. So a, a stack is basically just talking about layers of abstraction. So at one end of your computer system, you have a bunch of electronics. Um, and that is one end of the stack, one very extreme end of the stack. And those electronics, they you know are put in, into computer architectures to make what we kind of think of as computer systems. Um, and there is low level code that is compiled to run on those computer architectures in kind of in binary and assembly. And then above that, there are layers of code. Um, for example, code that runs uh, interpreted or in virtual machines that is then one, again one layer abstracted from the um, from the, the computer architecture it's, it's running on, and going even further up the stack, you get that you now have these really high level programming environments and these and these code environments you know designed for education and learning. I don't know. Um, actually, I think if you were out along last month. Uh, you might have seen Scratch. That was, uh, you know, the kind of thing the micro bit was using, which is uh, last month's talk was about, I believe. Um, and you know, this is like really, really abstracted from the ele electronics and the physics of, of transistors, but it's still, you know, part of computing and it's one end of the stack. Um, but asking every full stack developer to be an expert on the electronics to some very, very high level abstraction isn't feasible or, use or useful. So for my purposes, I'm going to slightly cheat and redefine what the stack is. So I always say the full stack is whatever makes sense in the context of the problem you're trying to solve. So for example, if you are developing um, some hardware, your stack might go from, might actually do some electronics or it might do something slightly high level up into say a kernel driver and maybe some um, CLI for that. Uh, for the web, which I use, uh, the stack kind of goes, you know, starts at a high level abstraction, but then ends closer to the user in terms of visual uh, user interfaces and graphical user interfaces. So when I talk about um, the full stack, I mean, in that stack, you you have the skills to be able to kind of solve all the different parts and, all, and work at all of those different levels of abstraction needed to be able to complete the task and solution you, you're going to do. So um, working in, in a product world, um, if you're developing you know, a, web, a web service, if you're an API developer but who does not know how to do user interfaces, if you're given a task, you can't necessarily complete it all because you wouldn't be able to say understand the um, the user interface changes needed. And similarly, if you're a front end developer who doesn't understand databases, you wouldn't be able to complete um, you know a, make a necessarily make an end to end change of your software because you don't understand the other end. So 
when I say full stack, and this is the, the general common, most people, when they say full stack, they mean this, it means someone who um, can work on all the different parts of the software stack as makes sense in the context of the problem you're trying to solve. And really the point of a full stack developer is it's about removing unnecessary wait times and unnecessary handoffs. So one of the, the trickiest parts of, of software development is actually communication and working in a team. So if you have to wait for someone else to do some work to be able to enable you to do the work you need to do, then that's, you're adding wait times, you're adding a communication overhead, you're adding, you know, this kind of, um, additional work and it makes slows things down. So a full stack developer really is about being an empowered developer. So um, as I mentioned before, I work um, on the web. That's um, uh, my platform of choice. There are of course other platforms available, um, either you know desktop applications in a traditional sense or you know the mobile mobile applications which aren't web applications. But I, I choose to work on the web. And I actually think the web is one of the most powerful platforms available today. It runs in many, many places. It's very flexible. It's fast evolving. And um, there's, there's also a lot of work out there out for it. So I think as Rebecca was saying about the job, the job market, when you when you hear full stack developer, they, they are often talking about um, web development in that. Um, but it's, it's still quite a, a rich uh, stack. So for example, on one end, you might actually have to care about um, databases and performance. Um, you might have um, then have to talk about the APIs, which implement, you know, potentially some uh, fairly heavy processing of that. Um, and then you have the code that runs in the client in the browser, which again is a different set of technologies um, than will run on the server. And you also have to care about the user interface and how they get presented to your user and you know, using this, these kind of web technologies. And you probably also have to care about the infrastructure that all runs on. So, you know, you might have to be familiar, say, with Linux and doing some systems administration, um, or in a more modern world, you might have to know AWS or one of these big cloud computing platforms. So when I talk about the full stack web development, I kind of mean this kind of stack. So you've got some backend code, you've got something running on a server, probably with some database and state management going on there. You've got the code that runs in the client that um, drives the user interface. Um, and you know it's a probably more hostile environment because there are many different browsers with many different um, kinds of um, incompatibilities between them, and of course your user interface and, and how you interact with the user, as well as caring about you know how this code all runs and how it gets to the user using one of these cloud-based systems. So. Um, of course, it is impossible to be an expert in everything. So I don't know how many people have come across this concept of what is called a T-shaped developer before, but the T-shaped developer is someone who has a broad knowledge base. Uh, so this is someone who probably knows enough to be able to do something simple in every part of that stack. But within that, they probably have some deep specialism. And this works really well in a lot of modern software development because most modern software development is uh, done in teams. So what you probably end up, or if you're constructing a good team, what you want to do is have a bunch of T-shaped people where those, those deep specialisms are actually in um, different topics. And um, especially when they are combined with different uh, disciplines, for example, um, business analysts, um, data scientists, um, you use experience designers, QA engineers, um, they can make like a really well, well found team where everyone can contribute in every bit of ways, but you might have experts in some areas that allow you to kind of give the deep, the deep specialisms um, that you want to have to be able to build um, good software. Of course, in, in practice, um, it's uh, people don't just have one specialism, you might know different bits about different things. So the T-shaped developer is a little bit of a spherical cow. Um, and really, you, you kind of your your skill set as a developer, a full developer, will look a little bit more like this. And you now I will quite happily throw my hands up and say, you know, I'm I'm the head of development at a, a tech startup, and I have people who work underneath me who know more about front end development than I do. It's not my speciality, but it's 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 theirs, and that's just the, the you know the nature of it. You know, you're not going to be an expert in everything, but you will hopefully know enough to um, to to be able to do some stuff. So um, I'm going to do a little bit of an aside because, uh, say, the web is my platform of choice, and I think if you're going to get into web software development, um, it's really useful to understand where the web has come from as a platform, 
and how it's going, how it grows. Because I think that um, says a lot about where the web is today, and helping to understand some of the ways web technology works is because of where it came from. Um, I know some people, for example, JavaScript is not a popular language, but if you understand how it came from, it's kind of a series of steps that all made sense at the time that kind of well, where we are today. And that's useful context to know. So let's start where we were before we had the web. So um, before I had the web, there was, um, you know, we had information stored in databases, but you had to know how to connect to that database and you had to kind of know the schema to know how to query it. And each database was kind of standalone. You didn't really have um, linked data between databases. Each, each database was a standalone thing. Um, and um, there was an, also um, a, another concept that was, it was originally proposed in 1945, something called hypertext, um, which was, a way of exploring documents through links within those documents, uh, rather than necessarily being like a book, which is like a linear collection, maybe an index book, but it's about um, this being more like a web of documents that you can jump between using text. And this grew into um, hypermedia, which was um, considering non-text, so images, videos, you know, other things. And, and most famously, um, this was, there was a system called Hypercard, which was uh, one of Apple's earliest, um, uh, uh, what sort of like power tools and that was very popular and that was a hypermedia system but hypermedia systems weren't weren't in general networks they were kind of standalone you had a, a standalone hypercard deck or you know set of hypermedia that you would um move between and um the internet and then other networks of course um before the internet existed and uh with firewall policies and servers that you could connect to and browse and download and you know interact with and then um, along came the World Wide Web, which um, was in, invented in 1989 by uh, Tim Berners-Lee. And he was building on previous research he'd done in the hypertext and hypermedia space. And it was whilst he was working at CERN, the um, European Centre for Nuclear Research in, uh, in Switzerland. And really the, the web introduced three key components. And it's these three components together that really kind of unlocked what we now know today as, as the web. So you've got HTTP, which is a, a protocol that could be used for requesting documents from a remote server. And um, you had HTML, which is a specification for writing those documents uh, for in a formatted way, um, including the um, hyperlinks. And you also had URLs, which are a way of identifying a particular document at, on a remote server with the remote server it is on. So a URL was like a self-describing way of knowing how to connect to the server over HTTP and how to get the documents. And this is really what, um, kicked off the web is the fact that these documents can now be a web on the internet and rather than just being one collection it was now one global inter interconnected set of, of documents and um, the web of course was not just about static documents published it was interactive uh, from pretty early on I was trying to do a bit of history to figure out when the form element uh, was introduced into html and I couldn't find um, any record of it, which either means it was there from the start or it was definitely there very early on. And the form element basically was a way of submitting, you know, a, a, a response back to the server and then getting some uh, um, something back from the server, which was then just kind of dynamically created HTML that was created server side in, as a, in response to a program. And then the common gateway interface was um, a way of doing that. So the web uh, from very early on wasn't just the static documents, it was server side generated a dynamically generated HTML that um, allowed to have some sort of interactivity. Um, the, the web evolved pretty rapidly. Um, so HTML was based on uh, SGML, which was, um, uh, I think it was an IBM standard for standalone documents. And, um, but the, the web, the growing web, they wanted some um, way of doing some simple interactivity on, on the client without having to do that round trip to the server with the form, so, you know, for example, simple form validation, um, you know, simple collapse, collapsing menus and those kind of things. So um, a guy called Brandon Ike, who's working for Netscape uh, at the time, was asked to come up with something. And he thought, well, why not take Scheme, um, a program language, um, and put it in the browser? And um, that was the original plan. And then somehow they got into partnership with Sun uh, who said, okay, well, we'll put Java applets into the browser instead, but we want a simple, something in between the full weight of a Java applet. So we'll, we'll, we'll make something that's a bit Java-like and we'll call it LiveScript. And they said, oh no, actually for branding purposes, we'll call it JavaScript. And that's where JavaScript came from. It doesn't actually have anything to do with Java. 
um, you know, it's it's a C like syntax, but um, you know, other than that, the, the the language is really far past. It was a really bad branding exercise that confuses lots of people to this day. Um, and JavaScript was uh, launched in Netscape. And um, around this time, uh, Microsoft wanted to break into uh, the internet market. So they launched Internet Explorer and Internet Explorer went and said, well, I, I like this, um, these ideas of interactivity. So we're gonna launch JScript, which is syntactically very, very similar to JavaScript, but actually didn't necessarily have the same underlying APIs. Um, so you have these kind of competing, very similar, but not quite the same implementations, you know, JScript and JavaScript and, and these kind of things. And that was a kind of a, a big problem, kind of held the, back, the web back, I think, for a while. I mean, in 1996, um, CSS was introduced. This is one of the other kind of core technologies that powers the web today. So CSS is just a, was introduced as a way of being able to override the um, default browser styles in a generic way, rather than saying, this bit of text is bold. You can say, like, all my headings are going to be this font or, or whatever. And then in, in 1999, one of the really key technologies um, in JavaScript was introduced. And again, this was introduced by Microsoft uh, for a product they were launching called Hotmail. Um, and it was called Ajax, which stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and uh, XML. And Ajax was a way of a web browser and JavaScript in the web browser being able to make a network request to a remote server and getting an API response back without necessarily having to do the full round trip of a form submission and getting brand new HTML and running that from the server. So Ajax was the technology that really enabled what we might call today um, web apps. And then the web kind of stagnated for a little bit, which was um, uh, kind of sad. So um, in 1998, um, there was uh, something called XML, which was an abstraction over HTML. So HTML was specifically around um, annotating documents. And XML was like, well, why don't we do that to um, annotate anything? For example, um, uh, vector graphics or I think there was a VR uh, XML thing. There's lot, lots of different XML things, all just generic documents. And uh, the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, who are the body that uh, published the uh, HTML web standards, decided that XML was the future. So we're going to take HTML, put it into, into XML and call it XHTML, and that is HTML expressed using XML. But at the time, um, Internet Explorer 6 really dominated the web browser market. And um, as a result, they never adopted XHTML. So even though the B3C were publishing standards after standards, none of the, like the vast majority of the market did not support it. So this was this really confusing time to be, to be a web developer, because do you like, do, you, do I build my website to match the standards, which is like, Pure, as a purist, that's what I should be doing, right? But at the same time, it's not going to work because that's not what my browser supports. You have to code for what the browser support, which wasn't a standard, it wasn't documented. So it was, it was a kind of a dark time for web development. Um, JavaScript was also slow. No one really uh, paid that much attention to it. Um, it was had incompatibilities between browsers. Uh, you know, the, the way, for example, um, UI events happened in Internet Explorer and Netscape were wildly different and you had to have... Um, these libraries, uh, jQuery was the most popular one, which would abstract over that. So, you, you know, it would use the right event model based on which browser you're on. Um, and there was this technology called Flash and Flash was really used quite a lot because um, it was compatible. You know, a Flash app would, would run the same on every browser because of, of the way Flash was done. Um, and it had some really, really powerful um, developer tools. So, um, Macromedia, the company that made Flash and then, then Adobe, spent a lot of time investing in those developer and design, designer tools to make some really um, very fluent web animations or web games in Flash. And Flash was also much, much faster than JavaScript at the time. So come on, now we come on to HTML5, which is kind of the, the moment the web really kickstarted again as a, as a platform and you know, as, a, as a development environment. So um, in 2004, uh, the browser makers met with the W3C and said, we don't want this XML thing. Um, we want you to make HTML5. And they said, no, no, we're going to do XHTML1. Um, and they said, we don't want to do that. So they went and set up their own group called the What's WG, uh, the Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group, which was separate from the W3C and was then um, an agreement between, I believe it was Apple, Microsoft, um, Google, uh, Netscape or I think probably Mozilla at that point actually um, and this was like a, the the new group that would focus on the HTML5 standard 
in 2007, the iPhone, uh, the first iPhone was released and very, a very strong, powerful message at the time was saying that we will not have native apps, compiled apps on the, on the iPhone. We will only have a, a mobile apps and so web apps. And obviously at a later point um, that, that changed, not, not that much later, but it was a really powerful message at the time. And also, um, you know, the, Steve Jobs only said we will not be having Flash on the iPhone, which really um, constrained a lot of creativity because Flash was such a popular thing at the time. And there was many reasons for that. You know, it might have been ideological. It might have been the fact that Flash probably would have sucked up the battery life of those phones. Um, and then in 2008, the first version of HTML5, which was the, the result of the what WG's efforts was published. Um, Following from, on from that, in, in 2010, um, Google introduced Chrome, and Chrome was really focused on performance. So it was about making the, the web quick. And this was because Google decided their future was in the web as a platform. And so they needed a, a fast runtime to, to run all this code in. So they introduced the V8 engine, which was a, a really, really fast implementation of JavaScript, and it completely blew away. Um, the performance of any other JavaScript engine. So you could do a lot more and a lot more complex things in JavaScript than you could have done at any point before. Um, in 2011, and in what was a really important move is Internet Explorer 9. And Internet Explorer was still one of the biggest browsers at the time, adopted JavaScript standard event model as documented and as standardized and not the bespoke one that Microsoft originally created back in JScript, which now meant you could write JavaScript that would run on every major browser. You wouldn't necessarily need to do one path for Internet Explorer and one path of code for everything else. So as a slight aside on that, I wanted to talk about the difference between um, websites and uh, web apps. So nowadays, there's a lot of focus, especially in, in technology circles and a lot of hype around the idea of, of the web as an application platform. So you might have heard terms like progressive web apps or single page apps. And they basically mean when you are using the, the web to deliver a, an app like experience. But the problem is that there are the web is also still very good for having linked documents together. You know, news websites, places like Wikipedia, um, just these documentation websites, and the document the document based web or you know, websites as I call them, um, it's still a really robust and mature platform. And just because there's a lot of hype around web apps and a lot of uh, really interesting web app technologies out there, it doesn't necessarily mean you should use them to build a website. You might, and if you do, you might end up. Um, finding that you will have a reasonably over-engineered solution that, do, that does more than than it should be doing. So there's it, one thing you should bear in mind: is like, am I building a website or am I building a web app? And to kind of know the difference between the two, then that allows you to kind of like frame technology choices that you might make on architecture choices you might make along along the way. So, um, what does the web look like today? So, um, HTML5 will be the last version of HTML, there will not be any more, there will not be a HTML6, but um, the browser makers slightly cheat because HTML5 is what they now call a living spec. So they, they keep just changing it and they keep adding new things. And if they add something, it turns out no browser actually adopts it, they take it out of the spec. So um, the H HTML5 does change quite a lot, but it's still all called HTML5. Um, the W3C will occasionally take snapshots of what WG's HTML5, give it a version number um, and move on. But for the most part, you can ignore it. There is a HTML5.1, HTML5.2, but they are just snapshots of this living document and uh, you don't really need to pay any attention to it. So HTML5 um, defines the, the document standard. So this is like, what do the characters mean? What do the tags mean? Um, you know, what's sent over the wire? But it also importantly defines an API for communicating with the past version of that document from JavaScript. And this API is called the DOM or the Document Object Model. So if you heard people talk about the DOM, that is just the interface for ex manipulating with and, and you know, interacting with HTML5 documents in the browser from JavaScript. Um, HTML5 um, also defines um, a bunch of web APIs. So web APIs are um, APIs that are available within the JavaScript runtime. So this is uh, could include things like uh, WebRTC, which is a video com uh, call um, API. Uh, it could include like the networking, um, I think of a better example, like a WebGL API, which is a way of doing um, 
uh, like computer animations, like kind of OpenGL and the web. And these are all part the part of the HP5 of spec, and they're, they're called the web web APIs. Um, JavaScript went to be standardized by a body called ECMA, the uh, I think European Computer Manufacturers Association, and it's now technically called ECMAScript, um, but everyone calls it JavaScript still. Um, because JavaScript went for about 15 years without really having any major changes to the language. So um, ECMAScript version 6 uh, was released in 2015, which was a massive, massive overhaul. It really changed a lot of the syntax, had a lot of new features, um, smoothed over a lot of the, the warts in the language. Um, so JavaScript was made in 10 days, and there are some interesting decisions that got made that in hindsight were not the right ones. Um, for backwards compatibility, um, those a lot of those things still exist, but you can avoid them just by using some of the new features um, as an alternative. Um, so ECMAScript now has a yearly release cycle. So they they stop using the version numbers and just said, okay, we're gonna call it ES6, ES2015, and uh, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019 um, are just like slightly updated versions of, versions of the language, and they introduce like slightly new features, um, but nowhere near as dramatic as ES6 was, which was really was an overhaul of the language. Um, I quite like JavaScript as a modern language. Um, it's a quite a nice, um, fairly functional programming environment. It's not like, purely functional, but it's um, you can do some really interesting stuff with it. Um, and the final part of the web today is CSS free. So CSS free is um, the like, version of CSS that defines you know how you can style and how you can and in, in, lay out a page. Um, and CSS free is broken down um, into the specifications made up of modules. So each module has a level, and um, then you can figure out, you know, which, does, does a browser support this level of the spec? So you might have a, a spec called the color. So there's a module called the color module, which specifies how you can um, express color. Um, and, you know, there's a new one, um, I think, I think it's color. I think it's colors level two now, which allows you to do high dynamic range um, in color specifications. So that's kind of how. So each module is versioned independently, um, but it's still within CSS three. So again, like there will never be HTML six. There will also never be a CSS four because of this new module based structure. So that's a lot about the web as a platform, um, and that's kind of really about how the web runs in the client. But of course, um, a client needs a back end, and um, again, I don't. Probably don't have the time in this talk to do a deep dive of the back end because even though the web is a fairly constrained platform, your back end can be really be anything that creates HTML. So you can pick many, many, there are many, many different technologies you could have on the back end. But it's worthwhile knowing, you know, basically the back ends, they either go from just a web server that just serves static HTML or file that, that is on disk um, and applications that generate dynamic HTML based on the, the request that was made. So um, an important thing to know is that HTTP is stateless. So if you make multiple requests, they're not guaranteed to be served by the same server. So the server might not necessarily have any knowledge about who you are. So um, that each request over HTTP has to incorporate everything you need to know to make that request. So um, there's technology called cookies that let you do that. And cookies are just key value pairs sent to the server every request. And that can help the, um, the servers you know, manage states and keep be aware of who you are in between requests. Um, there's a really interesting um, technique um, in web uh, backend design called REST or representational state transfer, um, which basically is about how if you use the web as intended, you can then start having these really interesting things being layered upon it, like authorization and um, caching as well. Caching is really important in the web because, you know, um, Imagine, uh, so I, I used to work for BBC. I know, for example, how many hits um, the BBC has had for uh, some major, major news events. And if they, if each one of those requests went to the app that generated it, they had to go do the database to give it out, you know, the, the servers would have melted. So caching is just a way of, um, you know, st storing the HTML and then giving it out to the same user. And th at the BBC, the cache times were really short, like a minute. So they were never too out of date, but then it did, did protect the back end. Um, and of course, web servers don't have to generate HTML um, because of AJAX and other these other related technologies. They can serve JSON or XML or these other structured uh, structured languages that you know allow API rather than human communication with them. And your backend might also incorporate some kind of non-HTTP things. You know, you might have workers that you know consume from message queues, or you know do or, or do some offline processing. But that's still probably it might be part of the stack of the product or service that is ultimately a web service. 
but it could be fairly detached from the web, but it might still be part of your, your stack as a full site developer. So that's um, so that's the web. Um, and now we're going to talk a little bit about um, full stack teams and what a full stack uh, team uh, might look like. So um, as I said before, modern software development kind of happens in teams. You are unlikely to be doing, um, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, do, it does happen obviously, but most uh, large scale systems are made in, made in a team. So um, especially if you maybe haven't as much experience in commercial organization or you're you know, fairly new to it. So you might not necessarily know what all the roles are you might be working with and, and what they do. So some these are some job titles you might you might see in a in a software team that are kind of the the non 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 developer or non engineer ones. Uh, so you might have um, product owners. The product owner is basically the person who's responsible for deciding what gets built. So they're supposed to be kind of going out there, um, interacting with your customers or your stakeholders, and ultimately the person responsible for prioritizing and deciding what gets built. And you might have project managers, and project managers aren't always the, the most um, liked member of the team, but they are they're a good project manager's worth their weight in gold because they're responsible for um, helping, the, helping the project run smoothly. So they need to know what's going on, uh, you know, what's going badly, what's going well, and they will often work with external um, stakeholders around setting expectations and communicating with, with them. So, for example, if you're um, delivering a service that has um, a bunch of external dependencies on it, uh, for example, you know, mar uh, marketing might be working on something that is, you know, we want to do, we want to, you know, do an announcement when this feature goes live. They will often have to coordinate all these timescales and all these things that kind of almost like sit outside of the team. Um, business analysts are people who will go and work with the wider organization to um, kind of understand often what their business processes are to make sure that the IT system you're building actually fits in with the processes of the, of the business or the organization you are in um, because it's it's no good to build an IT system that then maybe fits into a cog of a bunch of different other processes around it and then it just doesn't fit. And similarly, um, user experience practitioners, so this is people like okay, called designers or information architects, um, you know, they, they do include the people who do the visual design, the aesthetics, you know, um, graphic design, all that kind of stuff. But also it's about um, understanding how the um, users uh, actually use the product. You know, is it usable? Is it you can compete? Some, can someone come to it, your website and actually get the information they need out of it? Can they actually solve the problem that they, they came to use your service to do. And uh, for example, I'm, and I work it for a startup. So I actually work with the sales team really closely because um, you know, they, they might say, oh, we've had a bunch of requests from a customer, you know, can we do these to help get the sale over the line? Uh, so, you know, the, the scale of your organization might, might change and, you know, who you work with. And, you know, I, I encourage the developers in my team to, you know, do rotations on customer service because it helps them get a lot of empathy with the customer and, and all these kind of things. So there's like a full site developer, you will probably be working with a lot of non-technical people and it's really important to, to kind of understand what they do and don't be scared to ask them what they do um so when you're working a team you kind of need to have a rhythm of, of how you work so um really one really common way of uh, doing this is to have something called the daily stand-up so the daily stand-up is at the start of every day people get up and say you know what have i achieved uh, what did i achieve yesterday what am i planning to do today and is there anything that's blocking me? You know, can say, hey, hey I, need, I need, I don't understand this. I don't understand these requirements, or I, this has a dependency that I, I'm actually not ready to start working on it yet. And it's a good way for people to kind of stay in touch with their colleagues, so you know what they're working on. You, you say, oh, hey, actually, I'm working in a similar area, so maybe we should have a chat about that to um, make sure that we're not, you know, duplicating work or or whatever, or make sure we're approaching similar things in in the same way. Um, you probably also have some sort of planning session. So planning sessions are a really good chance to sit down um, and look at what's coming up. So maybe look at the next month's worth of work and say, okay, I, I know I have some visibility of what the, the, the work that's coming is. And we can start to think about actually what dependencies are there that we might need to solve um, before these, these things can actually be built and especially if they're external dependencies. And um, again, it's, it's that's a really common thing. And um, you also have, in addition to planning um, or, or part of planning, depending on how, you, how the teams work, something called refinement. So you can see here, they've got this little diagram showing like um, the further away something is from being done, um, the more 
uh, the less the more variable it is the less you know about it um so as things kind of are further away you will they will need to have work done to them to become more understood to become more refined and become more defined to the point they're ultimately expressed in code um, which is the ultimate level of definition really so that's um the, the kind of like team team meetings you might be having um it's also really important that the team um reflects and improves so um i really advocate for and it's very common now in the industry for have the concept of a self-organizing team which is the basically thing that the team works in a way that it wants to work as in what works best for the people in that team and obviously still still delivering the goals um, that are being asked of that team um, and um, you will often see a lot of places say, no, no, we, we have a business way of doing things and you must work that way. But actually in the context of, of a team, um, different personalities, different skill sets, you might have those slightly different ways. So they'd be able to like look back and say, okay, what went well over the past few weeks? You know, what should we stop doing? What do we need to change? You know, what, what, are, our, what are the things that are slowing us down and um, causing us problems? And those processes are called the retrospectives. And I would recommend uh, running retrospectives um, fortnightly or monthly as a way of making sure that you are kind of making sure that everyone is working well together and things are going well. And if there is things that are slowing you down or causing you problems, um, you you take them out of the way and you, you block them, uh, you, you block them. Um, and your team will probably also have to communicate externally. And, you know, this is one of the roles of the project manager, but they, they can't do everything by themselves. So uh, one of the, the most hated things I think of a lot of developers is the idea of having to provide estimates. So um, having to guess in hours how long something will take or days how long something will take can be really hard because actually until you've done it, you don't necessarily know is, is there a, you know, something hiding behind this stone? Is this, um, you know, actually you pull on this little string and actually your whole ball of yarn falls out or is it as straightforward as I think it might be? So there's an alternate uh, technique called story points, which is the idea is like you, you say how complex you think this thing is going to be. And sometimes you'll be right and sometimes you'll be wrong. But the idea is um, it all balances out in the end. And then you measure how many story points you deliver um, every week or every two weeks or however long and then you use that as an average to then say okay we on average deliver 12 story points um, a week um, that's how many you know how many things we've finished and then we say okay well we think the, the next this this thing is 20 20 story points big so we might take us a week and a half or you know two weeks to, to do it and that becomes a different way of of um, communicating estimates that exactly ends up being slightly more slightly more accurate than just trying to guess hours but and um, because they're not actually time-based you do um don't get health you know the if you something takes five hours not four it's it's fine because it kind of all comes out of the wash um so i think the last thing i want to say about this section is you know also how do you organize your work as a full stack team so the the most important thing i think for any any software project is to have a backlog a backlog is, is just a fancy word for to-do list. So it's a way of um, specifying the work that's going to be done. And ideally, the work that you have on your backlog um, is defined to the point where you know, I'm going to take this top thing off the to-do list, and there should be some, uh, enough documentation with it for me to understand what needs to be done to build it. So what you you might find is actually the, the, the backlog is split into, into portions. So we, we do this in our organization where um, you have a, a you know an ideas backlog and then it goes into a re refinement backlog and then it goes into a design backlog and then it goes into a dev backlog but it's still also the, the product backlog but the idea is that something has to go through some process to go to go to that stage so i i don't i never work on a um a, 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 you know something that has a user interface element on it unless a designer has you know done a bit of, of research and thinking and put together a little bit of spec out what that page should look like and sometimes things can skip the backlog so this this thing doesn't need any design it can go straight from refinement into into dev and you know, often bugs will just end up go straight into the dev backlog because we want to fix our bugs um but that's so but having a well-structured backlog that works well for your team is like probably the single most productive thing that your team can have because then everyone knows what they're working on everyone's working on, on, the, on the same thing and then there are a bunch of different techniques for, for moving through the backlog and each one of the, these probably you know could have a, a talk or a lecture series on them um and the most common ones are these agile methodology ones although not everyone uses agile agile methodology 
Um, but the Scrum, which is a quite, quite structured uh, Agile methodology. And the idea is um, in Scrum, you work in these things called sprints. So each sprint might be two weeks, might be a month. And the idea is at the start of every sprint, you say, these are the things that we are planning. So we are now going to plan the next two weeks of work or month worth of work. And that's what we will work on for that month. And then you get to the end of it, you do a retrospective and you say, okay, now we're going to plan the next month. Kanban is a lot more fluid. So um, rather than working sprints, you have a continuous flow. So you go, okay, I've, fit, I've done the top thing on my backlog and now I'm just going to move it. I'm going to move to done. I'm going to take whatever the next top thing of my backlog is. So that requires a much more continuous flow. So it, different people have different preferences. I personally use Kanban, but um, Scrum, Scrum has proven to be very effective in many organizations as well. So... The next thing to talk about is um, how do you make sure you're building the right thing as a, as a full site developer? So generally, um, when you start on a project, your project might be not much more than some ideas of, of what needs to be built. So you can have some ideas. So how do you um, really understand how to turn your, your problems and your ideas into solutions? So there's this really common technique called the, the double diamond technique, which is uh, made by the, the Arts Council Oh, sorry, the Design Council um, of the UK. And um, basically the idea is like you, you start by saying, um, is it like, sorry, it's like the, the famous Henry Ford quote, which I don't know if he actually said or not, but everyone attributes it to him, which is, if I asked people what they wanted, they'd say that they've said a faster horse. So the idea is sometimes a user or customer or whatever might come to you and say, I want this. And you go, do you really want that? Or why do you want that? And you, you kind of peel it back and say, try to understand exactly what it is they want. And you kind of go wide to try and figure out actually what is the best solution to this. So you so you take an idea, you explore it, you kind of split it apart, and then you do some refinement. So actually, you know, what we've, what we've learned from doing a little bit of research is actually this is what the real problem to be solved is. And it might be a restatement to the original problem, or it might just be actually that problem actually was hiding an underlying concern. And now we've peeled that back, we found out what the real underlying concern is, and we can restate it in that way. Once you've actually understood what the problem really is, um, you can then explore the solutions. And the idea is that you know, there might be seven or eight different ways of doing it. So you say, okay, the, these are the different top level ways we can approach this problem. Um, and now we can do, we can have a look at trade-offs and um, you know, define, this is the one we think is gonna be the best solution. Um, and you know, within the context of you know, the system, whatever you do, and it might not be, it depends how big the things you're doing. Sometimes this is a very quick process Sometimes you say, um, you know, we, we had one really, it was like, we'd like to expand into a new market. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's a big idea. And it's probably not, we're probably not gonna be solved in software. So how do you do that? So this is, uh, but it's a really useful technique for saying like, go wide, like read, go wide, go narrow, go wide, go narrow. And it's a really um, powerful way I think of working, uh, of, of trying to define your, your problems. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier in the back, you kind of want to document it so people have a shared understanding of, of what it is. If you, you know, I've worked on cards where someone's like, it's like add a log on page. And, you know, six people on the team have six different ideas about how the logging page should work. So um, it's worth getting around, getting around a table together in one of those kind of refinement things I mentioned earlier. And actually saying, this is how we were going to come to a shared agreement and actually share different ideas and come, to, come up with a, the way you want to do this and, and there's different ways of documenting that uh the one i'm going to talk about today is called acceptance criteria so there is like this is what we this is, we know we have done this when these acceptance criteria are met and there are lots of ways of expressing acceptance criteria but the one um i quite like is called given when then so given some background when an action is undertaken then an outcome occurs so given I am a user on a, sh on a uh, shopping catalog page, when I click the add to cart button, then the um, item appears in my shopping cart and you know the, the number zero appears for one. And this is also a really powerful technique for talking about edge cases, because I think this is something that gets, um, it's quite easy to miss. So you say, you know, what, given this item is out of stock, when I click on the add to cart button, you know, what happens then? And um, that's when I think a lot of the interesting discussion happens. And actually you'll find there's an edge case where all oh, this solution doesn't work this edge case. So maybe we have to go back a step and, and rethink what it is. Um, and these acceptance criteria will really help quality assurance because it gives your QA engineers um, the opportunity to say, 
well, this is what we agreed it would do, and it, and it doesn't do that. Or actually, I know it's what we said it's going to do, but it doesn't feel right when the product's put together. So maybe we should revisit some of the acceptance criteria. So that's why documentation is quite important. Um, the other thing to, that's really important to mention is software, you know, computers exist for humans. And that's what we've made them for. We've made them to make our lives better. So we have to remember at the end of the day that full site developer, we're, we're here to, to make things for humans. Um, so um, in the user experience space, there's this really, really popular technique um, uh, called user testing, which is, um, I think, kind of probably grew out of um, this kind of science, uh, science-based methods and, and certainly human computer interaction in academia. But you see, the idea is you, you, you build a website and you watch someone try to use it. So you say, okay, um, I want to watch you do the checkout process. Um, this is a very simple form of it. Um, and you see actually, oh, they, they missed the fact that there's a special offer there or something that I want them to notice and they didn't see it. So maybe that thing isn't designed right or they struggle to find um, how to, they, they wanted to know how much the delivery was going to cost. We don't actually tell them that's the last step. So maybe we need to bring that, that forward. And you kind of get them to talk about what they're thinking. And it's a really, really powerful way of making sure that whatever you built actually satisfies the needs of the people who are using it. Um, by you know watching them actually try to use what you've built. Um, the first time I went um, as a as a young developer to the other side of the one-way glass and watched someone use my product, I was like, oh my god! I thought it was really simple to use, and I really I really like it. But no, they don't know how to use it at all. I was like, then it takes a realization. It's like it's not it's not their fault. They're not they're not too dumb to use it. It was I I just made too many assumptions because I was too close to it, and it's. Uh, really humbling experience and it's something I definitely recommend all, all developers have a chance of you know watching user testing sessions or something they, they've built um it's it's really powerful um the other thing to talk about is um accessibility so um there is an ethical requirement to consider all all the people who might use your system um these could be people who come from a different background to you and um, so have a, you know maybe are on slower internet connections or they're using things on a, on a, a or a phone. It could be um, people who are differently able. So maybe people have sight issues. So you have to make sure, you know, things like, can, can you make text bigger? Um, can you um, do also, and there's an ethical obligation. But there's also a kind of motivating obligation, especially if you're in the commercial sector, in that if you, um, like, I think by some, uh, I forget the, the stat, but I think some like, 15% um, of Americans have some sort of site issue. So if your if your um, website is only usable by someone who's got 2020 vision, then you're excluding 15% of your market. And for what? Um, it's something you can you can fix earlier. So so considering accessibility is really important. Um, so that's the carrot. There's also a stick in that it's legally enforced. You now have to do this. So there's this. Um, I think there was a really famous case in the US uh, for Domino's Pizza where their website was not usable um, by um, people who use assistive technologies. And um, as a result of that, I think the, you know, the, the ADA, um, which I think is the, the, the law you have over there for that, um, is now being used by many people going after companies. So there, there is a, there's a carrot and there's also a stick um, and as well as the, the ethical obligation. And on, on the subject of ethics, you know, I, I didn't know what to put as, as the image here, um, but it is important to, you know, think about the impacts that your, your the technology you're building has on society. Um, there's there's many there's m many things to talk about with the ethics of technology, but it, it's worth having in the back of your mind thinking about how can this be used, but also how could it be misused, and um, you know what what are the goal like how what is the motivations that have driven me or the company that I'm, I'm working for, the organization I'm working for, to, to build this software solution. And actually the answers aren't always, aren't always clear cut, but you will find as an engineer, you're often um, empowered to push back maybe more than you think you would do, especially if you're a young engineer, you might feel less confident. But it, you know, should be worth asking, why are we doing this? You know, oh, actually I think there's something we've missed here. And um, it's something I, I, I think is going to become increasingly important for, for us in, as an industry. And there are definitely parts of the industry that do not um, consider this anywhere near as much as they, as they should be doing. So that's a little bit about uh, making sure we, we're, we're building the right thing for the right people. But also, we need to make sure that we're building the thing right. Um, so testing is uh, probably you know, one of the most important skills you can have as a developer. So knowing how to write uh, 
tests, knowing how to write testable software and being able to you know, test your software is um, how you are um, going to be able to like really validate and really give yourself confidence that you know, you're not gonna break something, especially if you're, you're moving at pace. So you might have, might have seen this before, it's called the, the testing pyramid. Um, the idea is this is looking at um, types of automated tests um, you might have in your system. So at one level you have unit tests and you probably have a lot of unit tests. They um, cover um, all the different possible edge cases uh, in your system and they, they, they interact very closely with the units of code. Um, you have integration tests, which um, tests slightly like larger units together as well as like a subsystem and make sure they work. But these tend to be slower. They tend to take uh, more setup. Um, so you probably have fewer of them and, and rely on the fact that you know, they, they test a few paths, but actually a lot of the, every single possible combination of edge case you trust is covered by the unit tests. And at the very top of the stack, you, you have your end-to-end -end tests, which are um, tests that are often driven um, through, um, for example, um, remotely controlled web browsers. So you're interacting with the software in the same way that your users would. And they give you really high level of confidence that the application is actually working, the things are together, but they are also the most brittle and um, obviously slowest tests. So you have even fewer of them, but the ones you have should be the ones you need to give you confidence. You'll also be working with um, quite possibly um, um, QA engineers who will also be exercising some of these things manually because there's, you know, there's, there's certain things that you can't feasibly automate. Um, but if you have um, a really good set of tests, it also gives you the, uh, this, this high degree of confidence that if you made a change, you've, you can very quickly check for, for a bunch of regressions across your, your application um, and give you a lot of confidence that you don't need to go through, like um, you're not gonna break anything for your, for your users. Um, there's also a bunch of what are called cross-functional or sometimes non-functional requirements that you might consider. So um, security, you know, no one is ever going to give you a feature that says, make the product secure, please. It's uh, something you should be considering um, constantly. So that's why it's called a cross-functional or, or sometimes non-functional because it kind of cuts across every single kind of bit of functionality you're going to write. So you have to consider, you know, how are we gonna approach security? Um, have we taken things into account? Um, um, all this kind of stuff like, you know, making sure like we've got the access control set up right and that kind of stuff. Um, you might also have um, performance concerns. So this is um, a thundering herd, which is a, a, a indication of some particular a particular type of performance issue you might have to mitigate against. So it's like you know, if um, how many people are going to be accessing my website? You know, you know, sometimes it, it's quick to write um, code that is slow, and if it's only going to be accessed by one user an hour and it takes a second, maybe that's fine. But if it's gonna be accessed by 100,000 users a second and it takes you know, you know, know, half a second to run, then maybe you need to optimize that. So um, it's about understanding actually what makes sense for whatever you're building, but it's it's something you're gonna sit there. And again, no one will ever give you a feature that says, please make the product fast now, please. It's gonna be something that you have to consider kind of at every, every point. Um, there might also be legal concerns. So um, in, the, in the UK, uh, we have the GDPR, um, I think there's similar privacy laws um, and obviously in, in different sectors as well. So the financial services sector or you know, medical services, there are obviously different laws that you have to take into account um, when you're building, building out uh, software solutions in, in those sectors. Um, the final thing uh, you have to do to um, be a full-stack developer is make sure that the, whatever you've built can actually be accessed. It can get out there and can be used. So, um, there's a really common technique, well, sort of fairly popular technique now for doing this is called continuous delivery. So continuous delivery is the idea that um, rather than doing big bang releases, rather than saying, okay, we're gonna release our software once a quarter or once a month or once a year, whatever, you make each change um, deployable. So each change, and this is very easy on the web because of the fact that people get your app when they visit your website, so they don't have to distribute binaries or anything like that. So this is one of the reasons the web is a really powerful platform um, is to make each change um, kind of deployable. So the idea is like you can have lot, lots and lots of small changes. And the idea is if you do something frequently, you become confident at it and you know it works and it de-risks it. So the idea is if you, if you deploy to live very frequently and potentially every um, every you know every change every commit at an extreme end of the scale you know you give yourself a lot of confidence so the processes of getting some code out there is you write the code you commit it 
it might be merged into your main branch. Um, you have some automated tests run against it. It gets deployed to a staging environment where some end-to-end -end tests get run against it. It might then be manually, manually reviewed um, by QAs, and then those deployed to your production environment. And the idea is every single one of these stages, obviously except for the manual review, is automated. So um, you don't have to you know, SSH into a server to copy some files up, because manual steps are error-prone. And if you're doing something regularly, it's even more error-prone. So continuous delivery is this really powerful concept that really unlocks full-stack developers to focus on developing solutions and not spending time doing deployments because it's, it's automated, it's used as your upfront. And the final thing to consider is um, how you how your application actually runs once it's um, in production. If, if it breaks whilst it's out there, because you, you wrote the code, your team wrote the code, your, your team is the best place people to fix it. So in a historical world, you might have had um, a separate operations team, a separate dev team. The dev team make the software, hand it over to the ops team, and then figure out how to run it. And then if, if the software breaks, um, and there's many reasons it might break, it might just be there's, a, there's an edge case that's hit. If the ops team then have to communicate with the dev team, that's another communication handoff. So if we go back to the reason why we have full-stack developers, it's because it minimizes all those communication handoffs and it empowers people to make the changes themselves. And that's why um, the concept called DevOps, which is the idea of um, developer and operations kind of working together in one unit and one team is powerful is, you know, it means that if you are, if it's the team that's responsible for it, it you kind of, you can resolve things quicker and also lets you understand better how your product is actually working out there. Um, so that's a very, very quick tour of uh, full stack development, um, at least according to, according to me and according to my book. And so to quickly recap some of those topics. So what is a full stack developer? A full stack developer is someone who is empowered to work on all the parts of the software stack um, and product stack and make sense in the context of the problem you're trying to solve. So um, I, I mentioned earlier, I prefer to work on the web and there are other platforms available. The web is a really mature, um, and it's a constantly evolving. It's a really exciting place we're doing work is in the moment. Um, and as a developer, you'll be working in a team with other developers, but also some of these, these other roles. And those skills you need to communicate with your, your teammates and work as one gel unit are as important as developing the code. Because you have to make sure that you are building the right thing which you understand from working with your customers, your users, also your colleagues, and you're also building the thing right, which you understand from working with, say, your user experience colleagues and, and doing user testing and you know, QA colleagues, if you have those in, in your team. And remember that you, you're building something to, to meet a particular solution. You know, you have your end goal in mind. You're not just writing code because writing code is fun, and you know, writing code is fun most of the time. Um, you're writing code to, to solve a problem. So don't, don't forget that. Those are the people who are using it. That's why we're doing this. This we want to make the world a better place with technology, and that's why you're you're writing these solutions. And um, yeah, and finally, the, the work goes beyond just building the solution. You also have to run it and get it out there too. So uh, thank you very much. Um, so that's the the link of the note sent up in the chat with the with the code. Um, but I hope um, you've found that. And I'm, I, I think I saw some some little dots, like so I'm sure I'm going to have some questions to answer. Uh, thank you very much.